Moray Rabotai. Yesterday we read in the Torah of the two and a half tribes, the tribe of Reuven, the tribe of God, half of the tribe of Menashe. And they came to Moshe Rabbeinu and they said, we'd like to live on the Transjordan side. We'd like to live on the other side of the bridge. We'd rather not go into Eretz Israel. Moshe Rabbeinu at first was taken aback. Don't you remember what happened with the spies? Don't you remember the punishment we got to those that spoke derogatorily about the land of Israel? And now you choose to live on the other side and forsake the land. After that rebuke, the two and a half tribes explained themselves and said, it's not that we love Eretz Israel. As a matter of fact, we're willing to fight as vanguards. We're willing to stand at the front lines to help the entire nation conquer the land, no matter how long it takes. Not only that, but we're willing to stay in the land until everybody gets their division, until the land is divided to all the tribes. It's not that we don't love the land of Israel. We love the land, but the other side is more suitable for our lives. Moshe Rabbeinu accepts. And the story ends. But we don't know what happened with Bnei Gad and Bnei Reuven. The Torah doesn't tell us what happened. For that you need to study the 22nd chapter in the book of Yehoshua. In that chapter the Torah tells us that Bnei Yisrael fought for seven years. You've heard of the six day war. This was the seven year war. In that war Bnei Yisrael ousted seven nations as well as 31 different embassies of the Goyim that set up their, their embassies throughout the land. And they were ousted as well. And Bnei Gad and Bnei Reuben were at the front and the center. After that, it took an additional seven years to divide the land. And Bnei Gad was there for the division. Fourteen years later, we pick up the story in the Navi. And the Pasuk writes, Az yikra Yehoshua l'ruveni v'lagadi v'lachatsim matem menasheh. It was only then, after 14 years, Yehoshua ben Nun calls the two and a half tribes v'yomer alehem, atem shemartem et kol asher siba etchem Moshe eved Hashem. You have been obedient. You have listened and you have kept the end of the deal. You did not abandon your brothers, not at the time of war and not at the time of the haluka of the division. And now, Yeshua says, I give you permission to go home to the land of your inheritance. It's time for you to go to the other side of the Jordan. And at this point, Yoshua turns to them and says the following. Rak. Rak means accept only. Shimru me'od la'asot et ha'mitzvah. Shimru means to keep. Me'od means very. Be very diligent. In order to keep, to keep what? To keep the mitzvah, et a Torah. Le'ahava et Hashem Elohechem, love of God. Le'alechet bechot derachav, to walk in His ways. Le'shmor mitzvotav, to observe His mitzvot. Uldob kabot, to attach yourself to Him. Uldobdob bechol levavchem uvchol nafshechem. And to serve Him with all your heart and all your soul. He tells Bnei Gad and Bnei Reuven, it's not enough for you to be shomer. Yes, we're told to be shomer Torah and mitzvot, to be observant. But for Beregad and Bnei Rehuven, shimru me'od. It's not enough for you to be a shomer. You have to be a shomer me'od. You have to be very, very observant. And why are they singled out for this extra measure of shimru me'od? I think the answer is simple. The Mishnah says in Pirkei Avot, there was a rabbi. His name was Rabbi Yosef ben Kisma. 
He was walking once in the street. It says he met a fellow and they exchanged greetings. After that, the fellow tells the rabbi, Me'eze makom ata, where do you come from? He said, I come from a city of scholars. Ir shel hachamim v'sofrim. So the fellow says, Ritzuncha shetadur imanu b'mkomenu. Why not come and live with us? We have a startup community. And we'll pay you all the money in the world. They were offering this rabbi, Yosef ben Kisma, a job. <clears throat> and he looks at the fellow and he says, even if you give me all the money in the world. I will only live with my family in a place of Torah. All the money in the world cannot pay for the makom Torah that I have. You're asking me to live in a desert? To live in a place where there's no yeshiva, where there's no mikveh, where there's no infrastructure, where there's no kolel, where there's no rabbanim. I cannot take that risk. Although I will be financially established and settled for the rest of my life, but there is even something more important than monetary gain, and that is to live in a makom Torah. And for that, there is no price you could pay me to leave a city of scholars. And I think that Mishnah sheds light on what happened here. Ben Egad and Ben Ereuven decided to leave the community. The majority of the Jewish people were living in Israel. At that time, Israel was all Jews. It was a Makom Torah. That's where the temple was. That's where the majority of the Hachamim, that's where the Yeshivot were. That's where all the infrastructure of Torah. And for whatever reason, Ben Egad and Ben Ereuven decided to go to the other side, Transjordan. On that side, there were still Goyim on that side. There were still foreign nations. And they risked a risk that the Jews in Israel did not have. It's much easier to remain loyal to the religion in a community when you're with like-minded people. But to go on the other side where you're exposed to all the nations and other cultures that are foreign to ours. There Yeshua said, you take a risk. And therefore it's not enough for you two tribes to be Shomer. You have to be Shomer Me'od. You have to be extra vigilant because you are leaving a Makom Torah and you're going to live in a very, very dangerous place that's dangerous for yourself and your children. You've made that decision. But with that decision comes a great responsibility. The responsibility of Shimru Me'od. Ladies and gentlemen, we must give great hakarat to our friends at Hazak. We are those Jews that are living on the other side of the Jordan. Those of us that are in exile, we're exposed on a daily basis to all the culture and all the degeneracy and all the loneliness that's around us, society today has veered very far from the center of moral values. And we're exposed to it and our children all the more so are born into it. And comes these great Sadiqim and Hazak and they've created a Makom Torah. They have provided for us life. They have supplied for us a buoy in the most turbulent waters of all time. And as a result, they allow us to be Shomer. Although we have to be Shomer Me'od because the tide is against us. Although we have a lot of numbers here tonight, thousands, I'm looking in front of me, thousands. Not only in front, but those that are watching it and hearing it. But we're still a minority amongst the myriads that don't think like us. Without Hazak providing for us these infrastructure, a Begveh, the yeshivot, the kolelim, plucking these kids out of public school, they're allowing us to be shomer Torah and mitzvot be'evet hayarden. But I'd like to continue. The pasuk says, so they got blessed by Yehoshua, they understood their responsibility, and they went on the other side. They got to the Jordan, and the first thing they did 
ויבנו בני ראובן ובני גד וחצי שבט המנשה שם מזבח על הירדן they built an altar Torah tells us what type of altar was it מזבח גדול it was actually a big one it was a monstrosity it was a huge structure they built the Mizbeach. Now they know good and well that they're not allowed to bring sacrifices on that side. Sacrifices can only be brought in Eres Yisrael, in the Mishkan. So what in the world are they building a Mizbeach? Why so big? So the Torah right away tells us, Lemar'eh. It was only for show. Well, what are they trying to show? And the Navi goes on to tell us they were well intended. They wanted to tell their children, as well as the people in Eretz Yisrael, we're one community. They built this big Mizbeach to say that there's a connection between us. That even though we've opted to live on the other side, but our traditions and our values follow the values of Eres Yisrael, and therefore this Mizbeach serves as a bridge, as a link between the two sides, so the future generations shouldn't think and make a mistake that there's two separate communities. That was their purpose, and if that was their purpose, it's a great purpose. But ladies and gentlemen, you know what happens when people do things with one intention, and they do it for show, sometimes their intentions are misunderstood. The Jews on the other side see this big Mizbeah, and they say, what? They're living on the other side of the Jordan for one day, and already they're starting to build altars to foreign gods? We knew that it's not easy to live on the other side of the Jordan, but we didn't realize they would deteriorate as fast as this. In one day already they built not a Mizbeah, but Mizbeah Gadol. They thought that the Jewish people had veered. So right away they went to the chief rabbi at the time. His name was Pinehas. Pinehas, the famous Pinehas that we read a few, a few weeks ago. And they told him, you must go on to the other side and verify what they're doing. So Pinehas right away with a group of emissaries makes the trip to the other side of the... Uh, the Jordan, to find out what this Mizbeach is. And if indeed it's Abu Dazara, they were prepared to go to war. The Jewish people felt that if those Jews on the other side of the Jordan are worshipping Abu Dazara, we're all in danger. We're all living on the same ship. If somebody in their cabin decides to bore a hole, everybody on the ship sinks. He cannot claim that it's his cabin. If Klai Yisrael on the other side is going to abandon ship, then all Klai Yisrael is in peril. So Pinehas goes and he makes the analysis. And then to his happiness, he finds out they were mistaken. Benegad explained himself, no, it's only a monument. It's only a symbol. We're not bringing any sacrifices. We're trying to commit ourselves to one community. As a matter of fact, at the end of the chapter, the Pasuk says, when Pinehas heard the intent, Pinehas ben Elazar Kohen, El Benegad ve El Bene Menashe, Hayom Yadanu ki betochenu Adonai. We know that God is with us. Ashelom me al temba Adonai, you have not rebelled. Pinehas comes back and gives the report, and the Jewish people were satisfied. The question that I come to ask you tonight is a simple question. You wanted to show Benegad and Bene Reuven that it's one community. You wanted to show that you're not a separatist. You wanted to show that Am Yisrael on the other side is committed to the values of Eretz Yisrael. No problem. So why do you build the Mizbeah? If it was me, I would have built a bridge. Anyway, that's what you're trying to accomplish. That it's one community. Why would they build the Mizbeah? If 
after all, you're not bringing any sacrifices on it. The pasuk clearly says it's only lemar'eh, it's only for show. So why build the mizbeach and the people misunderstand what you're doing? You created almost a civil war. Pinehas had to come and verify. Build a rainbow, a sign of peace. Build something to connect the communities. But to build the mizbeach. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say a chidush. Chidush that I read from the great Sadiqim. To me, it's one of the most important lessons. And it answers the question. We are clearly living in the times of Mashiach. Some have predicted after the, uh, the great victory of the current president, they said that already all the gematrias and all the simanim imply that already we're in the messianic era. We didn't need that. We knew it already before. It only confirms it. And the great Sadiqim all are talking about that. They were at the end of time. We don't need them to tell that either. We know we're at the end of time. We can feel it. We can sense it. Everything is moving very quickly. And the Gemara in Sota tells us actually some telltale signs what it's going to look like at the end of time. And I'm not going to go through the list, but if you want to dazzle yourself, go look at the end of Sota. And look at the list of the telltale signs of what it's going to look like before Mashiach comes. And you'll think you're reading this morning's newspaper. That's how current that Mishnah is at the end of Sota. Everything that it says is going to happen either happened or is happening. You read that Mishnah and you don't even need commentary. That's how obvious it is. And then at the end of the Mishnah it says that at that time, that at that time we are going to have nobody to rely on but our Father in heaven, Avinu Shabashamayim. Well, I always understood it that it's going to be such a hopeless time. We're not going to be able to put our trust, not in government. Government is going to fail us. They're not going to be trusted, not into military, not into economy. We're not going to be able to trust anybody to solve our problems and get us out of our mess, except for God. The people are going to come to realize only God can save us. But Sadiqim asked the following question. A question that I never thought, but it's a good question. Why is God called in this text, Avinu Sheba Shamayim? Our Father in heaven. Isn't he our father in heaven and isn't he on earth? He's everywhere, God. We can only rely on Avinu, our father. And why is he called Avinu? It should say, And the Sadiqim say the following. It's a novel Hidush. The Gemara says in Shabbat, I have the copy here, it's too small for me to read. I'll paraphrase it. It says at the end of time, Bore Olam is going to be upset with the Jewish people. And he's going to go to Avraham Avinu. And he's going to ask Avraham Avinu, what should we do with the people? Banecha Hatu, the Jewish people are in contempt. And Avraham Avinu is the man of Hesed. Is going to see that the situation of Klaisel has become so bad, even Avraham is going to say, Yemahu. God, you're right. There's no choice. You must destroy them. So God then turns to Yaakov Avinu. And he goes to Yaakov and he says, Yaakov might have more mercy. He had 12 kids himself. He knows what it means for kids to be a little uh, uh, disobedient, a little rowdy. Yaakov Avinu says, what's the problem, God? Look at the Jewish people. Manecha hatu. The Jewish people have sinned. Yaakov Avinu says, you're absolutely right. They're hopeless. Whatever you decide to do, even if it means yimahu, to destroy them, there is no choice. Abraham Avinu cannot protect Kla Yisrael, nor can Yaakov protect Kla Yisrael. So then it says, all of a sudden, Yitzhak Avinu. 
the father that you think is least capable in saving us. After all, Yitzhak Avinu represents strict judgment. But Yitzhak Avinu comes to God and says, they've sinned? I'd like an accounting. How much sins are we talking about over here? I'd like to see a spreadsheet. God says, what do you mean? So Yitzhak Avinu says, well, the average lifespan is 70 years. He says, well, the first 20 years, God, you don't punish people for their sins. So you Jews are not sinning for 70 years. They're only sinning for at most 50 years. And then God Almighty, you know, you have to also factor in that 25 of those years they're sleeping. You know, half the time they're in bed. So you can't punish them for when they're sleeping. So you're down to 25 years. And you have to factor in, you know, they have to eat, they go to the bathroom, they do their bodily needs. You know, they're not making sins at that time. And they pray more or less a few hours a day. And therefore you have to knock off another 12 and a half years. So what are you talking, God? You're making such a big deal for 12 and a half years of sin. And then Yitzhak Avinu tells God, listen, if you want, palga alecha u palga alai. We'll split the bill. You pick up six and a half years of sin. I'll pick up the other six and a half years. And we'll call it a day. Why such, a, why such an excitement? Why, such a, uh, why are we getting so alarmed over here? It's a small bill. And then he tells HaKadosh Baruch Hu, And if you don't want to pick up half the bill, Ve'imtem selomar Kula alai. If you're going to tell me to pick up the whole bill for Kla Yisrael, I am willing. I can afford it. Why can I afford it? Ha kerevit nafshai kamach. Because I sacrificed myself on the Mizbeach. I have money in the bank. That akedat Yitzhak can pay for the old bill of Kla Yisrael. Ana kerevit kamai kamach. I sacrificed myself. At that point, God said, you have a deal. Klai Yisrael will be saved in the merit of Yitzhak. And the pasuk comes along and says that the Jewish people will come along at that moment and break out into a chant. Ki ata avinu. They're going to turn to Yitzhak and say, you are our father. What Abraham couldn't do and the deal that Yaakov couldn't make. Yitzhak avinu, you saved us. In the merit of what? In the merit of your Mesirut Nefesh. You see the power of what sacrifice can do? When Jews live with sacrifice, sacrifice is to do something that's against your nature, to overcome the tendencies, to overcome the knee-jerk reactions, to live a little differently than everybody else. Nobody said it's easy, but look at the value of sacrifice. That's able to atone for the sins of the entire Klal Yisrael and it gets God to overturn his judgment of Yimahu. And the Jewish people say, Ki ata avinu. And that's what the tzaddikim say, that at the end of time, En lanu lehisha'en. We have nobody but to rely on Ela al Avinu Sheba Shamayim. That's Yitzhak Avinu. Avinu Sheba Shamayim represents Yitzhak. He's in heaven. And he's called Avinu Sheba Shamayim because the Zora Kadosh writes that on that day that Abraham sacrificed him, although at the last minute God said, take him off, but God placed Ashes on the Mizbeah. Those were the ashes, not of the animal. Those are called the ashes of Yitzhak. Avraham gets credit and Yitzhak gets credit as if he burnt himself for God. And it says those ashes are placed under the Kisei Kavod, and God looks at it every single day. And therefore Yitzhak Avinu is called Avinu Sheba Shamayim. He is in heaven. Those ashes are in front of God. And that's what protects Klai Yisrael. 
Anytime you see Jews sacrificing, in Hebrew we say moser nefesh, then already it arouses the redemption. That's en lanu lishayin. At the end of time, we're going to rely on one zichut, mesirut nefesh, the mesirut nefesh of Yitzhak Avinu. Now, I am sure everybody in their own right has mesirut nefesh. Recently, I saw an interview of a Jew that survived the Holocaust. But it's a different type of story. There were many Jews that lived in Poland, it seems, and they had choices either to stay in Poland or to run to Russia to escape. So they chose to go over the border to Russia. I said this story on Shabbat, and somebody in the Shirud, we have a doctor, he's an Ashkenaz guy, he said, My father was this guy. My father, you're telling the story of my father. So they went to Russia. But when you got to Russia, you might have got saved from the Nazis, but you had to deal with Stalin. When you come over the border in Russia, the Russians tell you your body can stay, but leave your religion behind. There's no religion here. This is a godless country. Leave your tefillin, leave your kashrut, leave all your divineness behind. The Jews had to make this, this decision. So they get into Russia, and immediately they put them on a train. And the train goes for three weeks. And they don't know where they're going. And finally, they go all the way to the border of Russia, to a place that's on the border of a place called Irkutsk. We know it better as Siberia. And the guy says, when I got off the train, it was 65 degrees below zero. And now we have to live here. They didn't give us fur coats. We're living with regular coats. And he goes along and says, had I lived in Siberia, he says, we knew we were Jewish and we weren't going to let the Russians take away our Yahadut. And he says, you know, my father used to wear tefillin every day. Now you say, oh, what's so difficult? You know what it is to lift up your sleeve in 65 degrees? He says, his hand was blue. But he didn't miss a day of tefillin. That's Mesirut Nefesh. He says, and then my father, eventually this man's father froze to death in Siberia. And they buried him in Siberia in some remote place of the world. But he says, he told his son, it's Sukkot. He made a calendar for the Jewish people. He made a calendar. He said, it's Sukkot. You have to sit in the Sukkah. He says, Pa, we're exempt. It's 65 below zero. You don't have to sit in the Sukkah. He said, we're sitting in the Sukkah. He says, my father said, I just have to eat a kezayin of bread. And he went into the Sukkah, and after he finishes his bread, he tells his son, bring me the Maim Maharonim. So, so I went into the barracks, and I found some more. By the time I brought it out, it was frozen, the water. That's Mesirut Nefesh. He says, we kept all the mitzvot under the worst conditions. And then the war was over, we left Siberia. Most of them froze to death, but a lot of them got out alive. And they still remain Jewish and religious. The Mishnah says in Pirkei Avot, Kol ha-mekayem et ha-Torah me'oni, sofa le-kayema me'osher. Anybody that keeps the Torah in poverty eventually will keep the Torah in wealth. My dear friends, we have gone through that Mishnah of keeping the Torah through poverty. That was the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, we came to America. This is keeping the Torah through wealth. But you still need the same Mesirut Nefesh. It might not be Mesirut Nefesh to live under Stalin or to sit in sub-zero temperatures or to risk your life to put on tefillin, or to dress modestly. It's a different Mesirut Nefesh. Today our challenges are different. It's to overcome all the yesterday and the desires, today's desires, the, the, the desire du jour, the desire of the day, whatever it may be. It's still Mesirut Nefesh, but it's Me'osher. Today we don't have anybody putting a gun to our head, or marching us onto cattle car trains. It's a different Mesirut Nefesh. It's the Mesirut Nefesh of luxury, living a life of freedom. This is the challenge of our time. The Kayemeta Torah Me'osher. That's why when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to get the Torah, the angels were protesting. And the angels told God, What is this? What does he want? What does this earthling want? And God said, He came to pick up the Torah. So the angels said, No way, nothing doing. We don't want to give him the Torah. Torah belongs in heaven. So God says to Moshe, well, answer them. 
Answer them why you deserve the Torah. So Moshe says, I'm afraid the angels spit fire. So God says, answer them, but before you answer them, hold on to the Kisei kavod and give him an answer. Why can't he just answer them without holding on to the Kisei kavod? <coughs> and the explanation is, because God was giving Moshe the answer. Tell the angels, look at the Kisei kavod. what's under the Kisei kavod. the ashes of Akedat Yitzhak is there. Angels, you are religious, but you don't have to sacrifice for your religion. The reason why Torah belongs on earth is because it's given to people that can overcome their tendencies. For a lady in our generation to dress modestly, God bless you ladies, like all of you are here tonight, that takes great sacrifice. God says it is for the stuff that's under the Kisei kavod, those ashes of Akedat Yitzhak. It is that reason why the Jewish people deserve the Torah. It's all about the Mizbeah of the Akedah. Anna karibit nafshai. Yitzhak says, I sacrificed my life. And as long as Klai Yisrael follows that, they can rely on Avinu Sheba Shamayim, their father in heaven, Yitzhak. And today we're seeing it. And that's my opinion what happened when the Bnei Gad and Bnei Reuven went on the other side of the Jordan and they remembered what Yeshua said. It's not enough for you to be Shimru, Shimru Me'od. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice to be religion on this side. This side over here poses a lot of challenges. You're living in a sea around you that is against you. You're going to have to overcome. So they wanted to build a symbol. They wanted to build a symbol for themselves and their children, so they built a Mizbeah. Not any Mizbeah, Mizbeah Gadol. It was only Lemare, it was for a show to tell their children, this is it, this is what God wants. The Mizbeah represents sacrifice, self sacrifice. And it's not going to be easy on this side, but we have to be willing to overcome the challenges. The Mizbeah is not a bridge and it's not a pile of stones. The Mizbeah represents the Mizbeah of Yitzhak of Mesirut Nefesh. Now I understand why Pinehas was the one that came to verify. The Zora Kadosh says if you take the numerical value of Pinehas, it's 208 which is the exact numerical value of Yitzhak. Pinehas gematria Yitzhak. Pinehas went to verify and he said, Vayitav, it's good. Pinehas and Yitzhak are related. They come from the same cut. Once already they saw that they're living with that concept, they said everything will be fine. And that is my message. That is my message tonight, not to the Jews in Siberia, not to the Jews on the other side of the Jordan, but to the Jews here in Queens and the surrounding areas. You're on the right path. You're living with the principles that rest under the Kisei HaKavod, the chair of glory of God. We have to hold on a little more. We're almost at the end. The Mashiach is near. We must cling on to the principles of Avinu Sheba Shamayim. And with this we understand and I conclude a custom that took place every year in Jerusalem. On the last day of Sukkot, the Jews would go to the temple and they would take these very long aravot, and they would circle them as Bayah. And then they would sing a song. And they would sing a song, and it went like this Yofi Lach Mizbeah. Yofi Lach Mizbeah. They would turn to the Mizbeah and they'd say, How beautiful you are! How beautiful you are. Klal Yisrael, when they come after the high holiday season, after great motivation and inspiration. They come to the Mizbeah and they say, how beautiful it is to sacrifice for God. 
instead of to sacrifice for nonsense and for the pleasures of man that has no value and no future, and that must be our attitude as well. Those that live with the principle of the Mizbeach of Yitzhak, Yofilach. And I say that to the congregation tonight. Yofilach, Yofilach. How beautiful, how wonderful it is to see. It is indeed a breath of fresh air. And I have no doubt that Be'azrat Hashem, Pinehas, who is Eliyahu and Navi, will Be'azrat Hashem come and redeem us. Pinehas, Gematria Yitzhak, and the Zichut of Yitzhak Avinu, Ki Atta Avinu. Avinu Sheba Shamaim. And at that time, Klal Yisrael will stand in front of Mashiach Tzidkenu and we will be able to say, Hazak, Hazak, Venit Hazak. Thank you.